played back. The first bill that we'll do is will be um, Wyoming Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund, House Bill 74. Mr. Vice Chair, welcome. Roll call, yeah, please. Representative Henderson. Here. Representative Larson. Here. Representative Sherwood. Representative Stiff. Representative Walters. Here. Representative Swanitzer. Here. Chairman Nicholas. Here. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Appropriation Committee. Uh, I bring you uh, House Bill 74, the Wyoming Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund. So I was on the committee when this was discussed during the interim, but it's essentially what it does is these, there's a lot of our communities here in Wyoming have this growing demand for these trail systems, certainly in Sheridan. We've got a couple, We've got some right at the base of the Bighorn Mountains if you're going up Red Grade. And quite frankly, originally, I was quite skeptical of them, but uh, as they got built, they immediately started getting used, both by residents uh, and, of course, by, by tourists coming through. And uh, over the last 10 years or so, there's been a proliferation of these trail systems throughout our communities you know, in Sheridan, in Casper, in Lander, uh, in Jackson, and a lot of different spots uh, around. And so I think kind of the genesis is um, these are in demand, they're heavily used. And um, just kind of having that, that funding source or having a, a robust funding source uh, for these types of projects in collaboration um, with local communities, municipalities, counties, and nonprofits to continue to build these things was kind of the, the idea behind it. So that's kind of the, uh, the macro context here, the, uh, the big picture. So I'm happy to, Mr. Chairman, would you like me to walk through the bill? Um, really, just a general description of what it does, <clears throat> and then we'll just get to the money. Um, so Mr. Chairman, so the, uh, the bill is written, uh, you know, creates the, um, uh, creates the income account, it creates the trust, uh, it creates the, the funding source, uh, which is uh, basically it's 5% it's of the state's portion of the sales tax, which the amendment that I've distributed on your desk uh, deals with that. Uh, it kind of creates the process for the commission and the Office of Outdoor Recreation to distribute these funds, kind of the sideboards. Uh, like, for example, you'll see that they have to have the support of municipalities because kind of the idea is um, these local entities, these, these, these towns and, and, and these counties have to be on board uh, to, you know, uh, in terms of just where it goes, all that kind of planning process, uh, ongoing maintenance after it's completed, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it creates a, um, um, you know, a requirement that they have to come back to the legislature, come back to the, uh, I, I believe it's the TRW committee reporting on you know, ongoing projects, completed projects, that kind of thing. So you have to come back and there's, so there's that oversight component, I believe it's on page seven or eight. Um, and again, it sets those kind of sideboards uh, for the Office of Outdoor Recreation and, uh, and distributing that money and what can be used for. As you can see, there's kind of that 80-20 ratio between uh, administrative expenses and the other 80% going towards the, the on-the-ground projects. Uh, and, um, you know, creates a you know, biannual audit and... Um, One second. Yeah. Thank you. What does that mean, administrative expenses? So, if you've got a project out there for a hundred thousand dollars, does that mean that they can use up to, or that they are appropriated twenty thousand for administrative expenses? And who does that go to? And then, um, how is that? Just, I, I need a little more detail on that. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson. Um, I don't want to. You know, just regurgitate what Director Westby said in committee, so he might be able to say a little better than I did. But that was one of the questions we faced. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, Darren Westby, Director of State Parks and Cultural Resources, thanks for that question. The 80%, 20% of how to use these funds, 80% shall be used to go towards granting. The 20% shall be used for the agency to use as administration. The reason that the 80-20, and originally when the bill was originally drafted, they put like a $50 million cap. And the reason for that cap was, or threshold to get to, was if you take just an average 5% return, that would give $2 million a year in granting and a half a million dollars for the office, uh, you know, our agency to run the office outdoor recreation that administers everything that the outdoor rec office does, does the collaboratives, uh, the actual running of the grant program. So it doesn't directly go towards the individual operator of the grant. So that's 
20% of the yearnings that come back that you have available to use, is that accurate? Mr. Chairman, Representative, that comes back to the agency to operate the office outdoor recreation. Then would you anticipate that would offset general funds in the budget of out, the office of outdoor recreation of a like amount or what would, how, what are you, that's a new income source, is that right? Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, right now, this program that we have within the agency is being currently funded through the Office of Tourism uh, account. And so in, in our budget, uh, supplemental budget request, we do have a $400,000 request to help fund that, because uh, right now we have no funds to op operate this program. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, uh, Director Westby, on page five, line eight, this relates to the same issue. It says no more than 80% of the funds in the income account may be dispersed for grants is what it looks like to me. So, and again, this is not directly with the money, just wordsmithing, but if you became suddenly very much more efficient and your administrative costs were much lower, say they were 9%, wouldn't you want this to read at least 80% instead of not more than? Mr. Chairman, Representative Stiff, thank you for the question because we had this similar conversation in committee. Uh, in, in the conversation as going forward, I think it, it would be a good amendment down the road. Uh, right now, this trust fund has zero. So the 20% of even if there was a million dollars in there, 20% would not be enough to cover the expenses of the office. Uh, I believe most of you uh, agree, maybe not agree, but at least acknowledge that our agency is a very uh, conservatively fiscal agency and we do everything that we can to try to decrease our expenses. And our hope would be that, you know, once we get to the point and the interest or the earnings are coming in at a rate that we don't need more than four or $500,000 uh, to operate this program, we would love to have that tip into the income account and get it granted or and or the trust account and grow the corpus. Absolutely. So to answer your question, uh, up to uh, versus or what was your language on the at least 80 percent um, language would be a meanable amendment to us. Just knowing how we work uh, on the conservative basis of our fiscal responsibility. Okay, further questions. Go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. So my question goes to uh, Director to the uh, infrastructure piece. Uh, are there not, are there not funds coming to your agency from you know the the trails? Uh, you know what we charge for like the snowmobilers, you know that kind of thing. Does any of that come? Help me understand how the existing funds are in place or sources of funds are are coming into the agency for these for these infrastructure purposes. Mr. Chairman, Representative Henderson, uh, if you're, are you talking ARPA related or just regular general, uh, generally budgeted items? Mr. Chairman, if, if I could clarify, and what I'm talking about is it's my understanding that when snowmobilers or off-road vehicles, they pay for their tag or they, you know, that, that goes on a sticker, and then a piece of that, if I remember the uh, the formula, is a piece of that percentage goes into the the process of coming back for purposes of infrastructure. Correct, Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, Representative. Thanks for the clarification on your question. We do have uh, our our decal or our, our user fees for the motorized piece. Uh, so all the motorized users, the snowmobilers, the ORBs, they have a special use fee that they pay to have a sticker. So a portion of those fees come back towards uh, maintenance and construction of new trails, specifically on the ORB side of the house, the dry land stuff. On the snowmobile side, those fees are go, go towards grooming of the trails uh, and the administration of the motorized office. Uh, Non-motorized, we do not have that mechanism, and this helps shore up some of the non-motorized as well as the motorized fees and the equestrian and anything of outdoor recreation outside of the trails too. I mean, this isn't just trails related. This is anything and everything outdoor recre recreation related, which could go towards uh, a shooting complex. It could go towards, like you said, building a trail and or anything outdoor recreation related. 
Thank you. Then just a final final question. Is 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 this 80% in addition to what you're already getting? Is that is that the plan going forward? Mr. Chairman, Representative Henderson, the 80% of the earnings of the trust of any trust account funds would go into the income account that we could use towards granting for projects to, again, uh, the, the intent of the whole purpose of the outdoor rec office program is to try to improve and increase the product development throughout the state to right now, not to say uh, Director Schober is having troubles finding things to market uh, to bring people into the state from a tourism basis, but having more product for her team to market, to bring people in, to utilize and recreate within the state of Wyoming is only 100% beneficial to the coffers of the state of Wyoming. Uh, they, they come in, they, they spend their money and they leave on a tourism basis. So Mr. Chairman, it'd be fair to say that the answer would be yes. This is in addition to what our no. Mr. Chairman, Representative Henderson, yes, this, this is on top of the existing motorized funds that we have. Yes, sir. All right, please proceed. Just kind of keep think, going. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Again, kind of going through the bill, uh, it kind of lays out some of the sideboards. Again, the proportion of, of, of administrative expenses versus, um, versus uh, you know, on the ground expenses goes on to again create um, some of the oversight you can kind of tell right there I believe it's on oh where is it here it creates the oversight uh, the biannual audit where they have to come back you know the director of the department shall uh, the department of audit or his designee shall audit the trust account the income account biannually uh, copies of the audit shall be provided to the legislature um, and again create some of that that oversight and again uh, Talks about some of the distribution. A lot of this language does get amended out in the amendment that I distributed to you all. And then of course, uh, has the, uh, the effective date of July 1st, 2023. And of course, Mr. Chairman, I stand for any questions. Go ahead. Thank you, Representative Western and Director Westby. This may be again back to you just on the structure of the, the trust fund initially. If that's just you're shooting for 50 million. Does it need to reach maturity before you start using the revenue generated off the in, income to do programs? Or, or, and I maybe it's in here and I just didn't see it. Or would you maybe that's not fully funded the first year? You start using whatever's generated, right? And that'll be a year out from whenever or a little over a year. So, Walk me through that piece a little bit. Mr. Chairman, Representative, Blake, it's right there on the top of page four, where it, uh, except as others provided in the subsection, state treasurer shall credit annually uh, the income uh, to the income account earnings and deposit them in the income account. So it all goes <clears throat> until it's 50, right? Is that accurate? Could you say that again? <clears throat> so all earnings go into the corpus until it's 50 million. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, then the way it's written right now, yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, not to be contrary to the vice chairman of the committee, in that amendment, the standing committee amendment uh, lines basically six through um, nine were deleted okay. via standing committee amendment. So the fifty million dollar threshold Just a target. is is no longer in there, uh, as neither is the date in which we can't spend out of the out of the income account. Um, from from the perspective of that elimination of that amendment. So, Mr. Ch Chairman, in that amendment, are you still creating a trust account, or are you just using those funds generated from this? this amendment for the operation of the, the annual operation. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, uh, we are still creating the trust okay. account. It, it just, we can, if we get $6 million, we'll take 80% of the earnings off of, 80% of the earnings to Thank start you. granting and 20% to help offsetting the cost of the office. 
that okay. that answers the question. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, you it might be a little helpful to walk you guys through the amendment if that's okay. Please. Thank you. So getting to that that exact point, uh, Representative Larson, on page four, through the balance or up to after the balance on line five, after trust account, that all gets deleted, but we're leaving that that language in there. Again, it gets rid of that kind of that target, that 50 million, uh, that 50 million dollar target that was originally in the bill. Um, and also there was an amendment that was brought in committee, as you can see on page four, line 15, after funds to insert in excess of $250,000 for one single project. Is that... So that's deleted as well. Right? Say that again, Mr. Chairman. That, that's deleted, the 250. Uh, that, that was added. added. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. So, Representative Western, then, do we do away with that maturity? I don't know the right word for that. That this maximum amount of fifty million is is that gone to or, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, that was actually a bit of an oversight on on my part. Originally, we struck that language just because the whole funding mechanism was just not palatable, but that was also struck and I forgot to reinsert some kind of, you know, cap or build up, um, whether it be 40, 50 million. And that's, that was my oversight. Okay, yeah, keep going. No, no. <clears throat> on page, or excuse me, on line 16 of the amendment, page five through line 18, um, the chairman of minerals brought an amendment that says a grant shall be provided to all counties based on the County's inverse proportional share of tourism income as determined by the Department of Tourism. Um, and then again, I'm line 24 of the amendment on page one, page uh, nine, line nine. After So, so what was the genesis of that? Uh, chairman Nicholas, I don't want to speak on behalf of the chairman of minerals. Uh, so did, just tell us what that means. Inverse proportionate share of tourism. Yeah, yeah. Does that mean that small? I mean, what's it do for Sundays? Mr. Chairman, the way I I read read the amendment is is exactly that. So those some of those the smaller communities or that don't get that larger share of the of the um, of, of tourism income like would get priority. Uh, was I, I believe that was the idea that. Representative Burkhart explained in committee. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. And just to clarify that, this amendment would require that all counties get something that looks like it would be have to be by inverse proportional share. So the county with the least tourism gets the most money. The county with the 20, ranked 22nd for tourism dollars gets the next most money until you get up to say, Teton County with the most tourism dollars gets zero or gets, gets a dollar or something like that. Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, uh, that is correct. Just, just my personal two cents worth, but I certainly appreciate and want our small communities to make sure that they get a, a crack at this money. So they deserve you know, recreational trails as much as anybody. The concern is that you know, we look at where all the tourism is in the state, right? And that's generally the Northwest part of the state. That's where there's gonna be a lot of demand for these types of trails, obviously, they, there's lots of local money as well, but that's where a lot of the demand is going to be. So, yeah, so the, the question: Do you want the biggest bang for your buck, or do you want to build trails outside of Sundays? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that is ultimately for for this committee to decide yeah, right now. That, that's for days to come. So, anyway, now go down to the to section three because that's the the big ticket item. Mr. Chairman, yes. Yeah, so. The bill as it originally wrote was diverting sales tax money before it even hit, hit the general fund, which as I'm sure you all can appreciate, there's some, some concerns there. Um, but in consultation with the Department of Tourism, the idea was to uh, appropriate money from their reserve account, uh, that, that $6 million, uh, and have that kind of be the, the seed money for the account to kind of get the, get the ball rolling. Um, um, so... 
obviously we'd like to have tourism come up and chat about that <clears throat> so that um, and get your input. Welcome to Anne. How are you? Good. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Diane Schober, Executive Director of the Wyoming Office of Tourism. And uh, Mr. Chairman, did you have a specific question that you wanted to ask about well, this? Well, I mean, do you tell me, just tell me about your feelings about the use of the dollars. And if so, how best could it be used on trails? I mean, obviously, theoretically, you should have some impact on that decision for us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, as many times when we've been before uh, the Appropriations Committee, we've talked about marketing, but then what are we doing in other ways to grow healthy communities across Wyoming? And there's certain areas that there is a lot of product development already in place. And so the tourism economy in those locations is much more robust than in some other areas. And certainly one of the goals that our office has is to disperse visitors around the state of Wyoming and to have them stay longer, spend more money. But we also need things for them to do um, in other areas where there's not as much development. And so in working in conjunction with the uh, Office of Outdoor Recreation, even before the uh, thought around the Outdoor Recreation Trust Fund came to be, is that um, the work to develop these outdoor recreation collaboratives and to work with communities to really develop product is the beginning of a way to move visitors into other areas, as well as residents. I mean, the visitor economy and the um, um, is also a very important lifestyle enhancement for communities across Wyoming and for residents. And so it has long been um, part of our strategic objectives is to support work of product development for uh, that happens not only through the Division of State Parks, but other agencies with which we work, like the Department of Transportation and, and others. So the Office of Tourism remains in support of this. Uh, the statutory language that defined the uh, project reserve and trust fund fits ideally with tourism related projects. And this aligns, I think, very nicely with uh, what that legislative intent was around the project and reserve fund. Yeah, well, that's glad. I'm glad to hear that because, as you know, I tend to be probably the most loosey goosey with your budget. <laughs> but I like this. I mean, <laughs> this is a nice thing to do. And so, <clears throat> In fact, I mean, if it was up to me, I would use some of our excess revenues to match your dollars, at least for a while, to get this fund up and grow it faster. But um, no, I appreciate your, because it, it's a big deal. I mean, if we improve these trails around, I mean, just take Thermopolis, for example, it could be an incredible bike mecca if we do it right. Um, and, and it would just be a, a boon to, to our tourism thing. So just lots of different things we could do. And Mr. Chairman, just in wayfinding or trailhead enhancements, I mean, any of these number of things that are, that elevate the level of the visitor experience, the resident experience. So yeah, definitely. Okay, well, I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Questions for Diane. Go ahead, Representative. Director Schober, what is the balance approximately in the tourism reserve account now? Mr. Chairman. Representative Stith, right now, as of December 31st, in the account, there is $5,705,981. And um, the collections to date from January 1st of 21, when the statewide lodging tax went into effect through December 31st of 22, uh, the deposits into the account have been 5,455,981. dollars those are the sources, the Wyoming Department of Revenue from their monthly uh, sales and, and use tax distributions. And then through the budget session, the spending authority that was approved through joint appropriations of the legislative body, 5,750,000 in projects, leaving to date then the balance of 5,705,981. Mr. Chairman, follow up. So, Director Schober, this bill, I think, contemplates taking $6 million out of that account that has 5.7 in it, and then by annualizing it, if, I, if I'm reading that correctly. So, does it just mean practically, as a practical matter, that you won't really have a reserve account, that, that all the funds that would go into a reserve account just get diverted, diverted to this use? 
Mr. Chairman and Representative Stith, so um, every month there's deposits made into that account, and it's averaging on an annual basis right around six million a year, five and a half to six million a year. We don't have much history on it because it just started in uh, 21. Uh, so then biennialized, that's anywhere from roughly 11 to $12 million that the fund is generating. And so this would only account for roughly at this point, at this rate, about 50% of what is generated for this reserve and project account on a biennial basis. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Excuse, excuse me, uh, Director. Um, is that fund number 446? that you're referring to? Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Zwanitz, could you repeat that, please? Is it the fund that we're referring to, is that uh, fund number 446 in your in our data book? Well, and if it is, it's the one that we're taking the, the money out. I just, the committee ought to give an update as of yesterday, it had uh, 9,642,000, some odd change in it. So uh, it should have money in it. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman and Representative Zwanzer, I can't answer that specifically. Unfortunately, I don't have the budget in front of me, so I don't know the actual fund amount or fund number. I do if I'm looking at it, of course, but I can get that for you to specifically answer okay. that. But I do know just on the monthly receipts that we get that are designated through the Department of Revenue for this particular account, that that's the balance that's in there. Yeah. The point is that you've evaluated, you and I think it's going to be roughly half of the amounts you come into, and you're with the Okay. History, history would indicate as such, Mr. Chairman. Okay, further questions for? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just functionally speaking, in that section three of the amendment, if we, we, you could theoretically hold all this money to the end because it just says you shall transfer it at some point. And not knowing who is going to be your, following your footsteps, uh, if they weren't as excited about the program, they could. So if we were to put in language that said transfer quarterly, uh, an amount until that six million has been met, will that value up from a cash flow basis, or or would you prefer annually? That's we have. I think we need to put in some language there to make sure that the transfers take place at a timely in a timely fashion instead of being rat holed to the end. The money of the would get invested faster, and you, <clears throat> so you'd significantly increase your rate of return if we did a quarter. Uh, Mr. Okay. Chairman and Representative Walters. Um, how you would decide to distribute that money would be, uh, I, I, I think that would be inconsequential to us. We, we don't have uh, authority over the money until it's appropriated use through uh, this process. And so as of now, anything that's in that fund balance is not available for spending authority. And so whatever you would decide here to do with that would, I think, establish then um, how this trust fund uh, would receive those funds out of the project, uh, the tourism project and resort account. Further questions? All right, <clears throat> anything else? So committee, um, there's lots of things I'd like to do with this bill, but most of them we can't do today. So <clears throat> is there a motion on the bill? Move do pass and second it. Any discussion? Any public comment? We don't always do public comment on re-referrals, but sometimes we do. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Brett Moline, Wyoming Farm Bureau Federation. Appreciate some of the aspects of this bill. Um, one thing that my organization does not support is establishing a trust fund. Uh, we'd rather have those. I, Rather have that much like some of the other programs that we fund that's a percentage of goes to this program. So instead of setting up a corpus that, you know, perhaps doing a percentage of the tourism funding would go to the outdoor recreation that would be up for the grants. Instead of, you know, setting up a trust fund that you know, one of our concerns is that when you have a trust fund, many of those decisions are made by non-elected officials rather than, you know, they're, they're appointed rather than elected. We'd rather have it in the hands of the, uh, of the elected. Um, I realize that you folks probably don't want to see every $10 
expenditure, but much, you know, like some of the other, you know, I know right now it's been amended in there that any, any expenditure, any project over that funds of, uh, I believe it's 250,000, that that would have to get uh, legislative approval. I, if that number came down to like a hundred thousand, that would be more amenable. But just speaking in, in all honesty, there might be some of my ag guys that want to do something for outdoor recreation to help them diversify their operation. So not against so much the program, but as the funding of it through a trust fund. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would sit for any questions. Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. So similar to the Wildlife Trust Fund is has, um, has your does your organization support the Wildlife Trust Fund or would you recommend we change the structure of that as well? Mr. Chairman, Representative, we have policy against establishing these trust funds. That one's already established. That water has flown underneath the bridge. But on this one that's right in front of us, this is a current issue. So we could change it. And I guess that's my question because this is set up similar. So I'm just asking you, would your organization suggest then that we change the structure of the Wildlife Trust Fund to? We would way? appreciate it. Okay. I realize that's probably not, you know, as I said, sir, that water has flown, flowed, has gone through. But you know, on this being in the future, again, not against the program. Some of my members might take advantage of it, but keep be keeping more of those decisions in the elected body rather than the uh, an appointed body. Kind of gets to the gist of our argument. With that, Mr. Chairman, if there's any other questions for me, nope, please. Okay. But any other comments? Thank you for this opportunity. You bet. Come on. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Chris Brown, representing the Wyoming Hospitality and Travel Coalition. I'll be brief, Mr. Chairman, we're in support of the bill and we're in support of the amended funding mechanism of using that reserve account to help fund this trust fund. When I think about the dialogue around the tourism budget over the last 10 or so years, I feel like this bill addresses two of the sticking points that we've run into a number of times. This bill would send tourism dollars to something other than marketing, to something that can build out product development around the state. And when I think of building out product development around the state, it also speaks to we're not just worried about the north, the northwest corner of the state. The best way to grow the state's second largest industry is to spread people out and to move them around the state. And all 23 counties, if this bill were to pass, would have the ability to utilize these funds to build up product development in their in their communities. We think this is an important bill to move forward. Okay, any questions? Mr. Chairman. We do have a Sarah Brown Matthews that just raised her hand. Um, Representative Stiff. Mr. Question, just a question for Mr. Brown. Do you expect significant private or other grant funds to come into the fund from non-state sources if this fund were created? Mr. Chairman and Representative Stiff, um, I, I can't answer that. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. We're coming more from the angle that we believe these, tour, these dollars that are coming into the tourism reserve account are appropriate to be used to help this get propped up. Okay, uh, let's go quickly to the online. And if Ms. anyone else wants to speak, please come on up and sit down. Ms. Matthews. Thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. I apologize. I wasn't, I didn't have a screen to show that. Thank you so much for your time, Chairman and members of the committee. And I will keep my my comments brief. I uh, am Sarah Brown Matthews from Albany County. I serve as the executive director for a area called Pilot Hill Recreation and Wildlife Habitat Management Area which is a collaborative effort by the city, the county, the university, and the Office of State Lands here in Albany County. I also serve on our local parks, trees, and recreation advisory board and the tourism board. So I come from the perspective of um, those small communities across our state 
that really have a vision for what they'd like to see in terms of enhancing community health and well-being and also um, adding some economic vibrancy to their communities. The recreation area that we are really working on in Albany County um, is a community planning project. And by having a trust fund so that we know that long-term planning and strategic visioning um, can ultimately have a, a <clears throat> potential funding source, it's critical to the success of these projects. So I encourage you to um, continue to refine this, this trust bill. I think it has a lot of strong elements to it. And I appreciate the vision that the legislature has in, in creating opportunities for funds to generate long-term sustainable um, grant monies for organizations like ours as we build out the infrastructure. In the recreation world, we kind of talk about the fact that people often think that the trailheads and the trails, et cetera, are, are really there to, to um, serve the people. But in my perspective, they're there to protect the land. They allow us to um, focus users on the property in the way that we most want them to utilize the area and really create a, a long-term legacy resource for our communities to, to grow upon. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Oh, this is a different thing. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Any other public comment? We'll close public comment. Now, we'll do a motion on the bill. The bill do pass. The <clears throat> bill do pass. Are there any amendments? Is there any amendment to add to match the six million from, from our excess revenues? Sure, we, can, we can add money. Sure. And, Mr. Chairman, I will make a motion to add six million from our general fund to match this. And so the question is, where would, is, is there a place to put it in, in the bill? Mr. Chairman, I'm getting assistance here. Um, put six million into the income account. I, actually, I think the way to do it is we could say where, where the where the references the um, six million for tourism dollars that to be matched by six million initially to be matched by six million from the general fund. So it would fit there. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. That motion carries. The up on that is. <laughs> okay, as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? That motion carries. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, roll call. Representative Henderson. Aye. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Aye. Representative Stiff. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Representative Swanitzer. Aye. Chairman Nicholas. Aye. Okay, let's. Um, Let's help the people that are here so I have a stage here. Which one would like to do next? I don't Which one? 34. Okay, 34. We'll do a quick re-referral. Yep. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Please proceed. I don't know. I don't know if we have anybody here, and yeah, I don't. Actually, I told the chairman that we would do it without him. So just go right. But what this does is provide opportunities for. We put eleven million five hundred twenty thousand into the public school foundation program account, or from the the program account to the Department of Education for a grant program for mental health um, out to the uh, the districts. Any public comment? <clears throat> Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Motion on the move to pass. Second. Move to pass. Move to second. Discussion. Seeing none, roll call. Representative Henderson. Yes. Aye. Representative Larson. Yes. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Aye. Representative Stiff. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Representative Swanitzer. Aye. Chairman Nicholas. <clears throat> Hi.
So next we'll do House Bill 148, Airport Liquor License Amendments. Representative Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I bring to the committee today uh, House Bill 148. This is uh, amending the uh, airport liquor license bill that I brought last year. And all it does is it adds on page two, uh, lines three through six, some new language stating that these alcohol sales will take place in the concourse of the commercial uh, airport where air travel and is occurring, just to make sure that airports are large facilities and they have multiple buildings and other locations. They could have cited a potential liquor store or bar utilizing this uh, liquor license, and it was the intent of this bill a year ago that this would allow for patrons who are flying, the flying public to be able to access this. And really it's even more than that. It was to allow for folks who want to take a, a uh, souvenir bottle with them as they travel out of this, leave Wyoming and take, that, take it with them. Uh, if they're worried about it breaking in their, in their uh, checked luggage and they want to carry it on, you can only take, I believe it is three ounces through security but an air, airport could offer this souvenir opportunity on the other side of security so you could purchase it there and then be able to take it home with you. And that was really the, the intent and the, the idea behind this. And by allowing the airport to have that license uh, directed to them from the legislature, then it does not take a license out of what I would call the pool of licenses available in a municipality. And so it, it freed up a liquor license to that municipality, as well as offering the uh, traveling public the opportunity to take that souvenir home with them. And so this really just cleans that, tightens that up a little bit to make sure that it's just at the uh, terminal building itself. With that, I'd take any questions or ask for your favorable vote. Public comment. We do have a Devin Brubaker. Okay, Mr. Brubaker. Mr. Chairman, committee. Mr. Chairman, committee members. My name is Devin Brubaker, uh, Airport Director at Southwest Wyoming Regional Airport. I'm not seeing where I could turn my camera on. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, um, but I uh, stand before you representing the Wyoming Airports Coalition, and uh, we we understand uh, the bringer of the bill. Uh, Good Representative Walters, we understand the intention of the bill. We understand the intent of the legislative intent from last session. Um, we do uh, struggle to understand how this could impact our ability uh, to utilize that liquor license at our general aviation terminals. I'm not sure if uh, maybe the bringer of the motion, if it would be your pleasure, Mr. Chairman, could help us better understand that. Um, but in general, we understand the intent of the legislation and uh, look forward to working with the bringer of the bill and, and other stakeholders to find uh, find solutions that work for all parties going forward. Mr. Chairman? What, what, you want to comment on that? <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the original intent of this bill was never to apply to the general aviation component because that typically takes place in a different building at, at the uh, nine different uh, nine different commercial airports in the state of Wyoming. Maybe there's a couple that they're combined to the same building. This was always about the commercial traveling public. The general aviation side of the, of the airport does not have a security checkpoint. So theoretically you can take bombs onto your airplane or anything else you want. It's your private airplane. It's called general aviation for a reason. You can take as much alcohol onto your airplane as you want. There is no security requirement. That's why this was specifically directed to the commercial side of the airport. And uh, I guess that, that's why I don't see that there's any need to worry about the, the general aviation side of an airport. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Brubaker, and I, I think you've made this clear already, but what I think what you're saying is that from your perspective, you would prefer if the liquor license would be available at the general aviation terminal also? Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, uh, that is correct, uh, specifically here in Rock Springs, and as is the case other places, um, I believe it provides an opportunity for the souvenir type sales that uh, Representative Walter spoke about before, both at the FBO and, and at the terminal, uh, but I really appreciate the clarification from the, the bringer of the bill, um, but yes, the, the answer is yes, Representative Stith. Okay, 
Right. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Woo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Mosier, Wyoming State Liquor Association. Uh, we support this legislation. We think it clarifies the original leg legislative intent of House Bill 55, which we supported and was passed last year. Uh, to clarify and to the good bill sponsor explained, originally we were talking about a bar and grill license style thing, but then there's a uh, gentleman on the other side of the building who has an operation in an airport, and he said a lot of gift shop, Wyoming products, stuff like that, which is why we gave him the ability for a packaged liquor store. Uh, we worked with the bill sponsor this last time uh, with House Bill 55. We don't usually support giving free liquor licenses away, not surprisingly. Uh, but the reason we did is because this was ec an economic development tool specifically for airports and for air transportation uh, promotion. Uh, it was not meant to be a competing packaged liquor store or bar or restaurant. Some of you might remember, if you're old enough, that my establishment, which did some pretty decent business, was at the airport, but I had my own full retail liquor license, and I was a bar and restaurant at an airport, not an airport bar and restaurant. Here we're talking about an airport bar and restaurant that's there to service its customers and promote, promote that traffic there. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is, as I mentioned, we don't always support these, but we have in the past. Uh, golf courses, municipal golf courses, uh, civic centers, large rodeos, but those don't compete to life directly with the private sector. Uh, if you're opening a packaged liquor store, you're competing with the private sector in a space that's already taken by people who had to pay for their own liquor licenses and weren't giving it, given a free one and who were in that space. So I think it's a good bill. Uh, if uh, <laughs> we do these a lot, this may seem a little unusual, but sideboards, uh, I like to think of myself as a lobbyist, being a lobbyist that I'm the Lord of unintended consequences, but sometimes I miss them and I miss this one. I mean, when the bill passed, I don't think anybody would have imagined that the liquor license would be used for anything except airport promotion and economic development. So as such, once again, uh, we support this bill. We feel it brings the bill back to what its original intent was, and I would be glad to take any questions. Okay, questions. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mike. Thank you. Any Mr. other public comments? Come on up. <clears throat> Oh, it goes green. The, the green light should go on. <clears throat> That's how you know it's working. And pull it a little closer. I manage an airport. You think I could figure out a microphone? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Chairman Nicholas, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Tim Bradshaw. I'm the aviation director here at the Cheyenne Regional Airport. I'm joined by Ms. Jennifer Nelson. She is our chief financial officer for the airport. Uh, I would like to just take a few minutes to give you a little bit of information about the Cheyenne Regional Airport, our capital city airport. We are a joint powers board that receives no funding from the city and county for our operations. At this point, we actually we rely on all of our revenues from our many leases and buildings that we operate on the airport. Uh, we completely with our building and our land leases. Uh, we receive no revenue from any other sources. In fact, our commercial air service is subsidized to two and a half million dollars a year through the state of Wyoming and through local contributions from the city and the county as well. I joined the airport uh, last winter and I was not aware of the initial legislation until it had passed and went into effect in July. As a new director, I was hired to create new revenue sources for Cheyenne Airport to help sustain it for decades to come. Through this process, we reviewed the opportunities to use the retail liquor license as allowed in the original language. Ultimately, we determined that the most beneficial place for this to be was in our future general aviation terminal. You may remember the old Cloud 9 that Mr. Moser used to operate the old terminal. Uh, that was our original intention was to operate it there. But we're not in a position to do that this time because we're, we're seeking federal grant funding to renovate that facility. And there's only one single location for this retail liquor license. We looked at putting in our, our retail liquor store in the current commercial terminal, 
However, our only option would be to place it on the unsecured side of security, which would preclude any travelers wishing to purchase Wyoming distilled spirits as a souvenir sales from carrying it through TSA security. You know, we're, we're small compared to like, like Jackson Hole, for example. They have a lot more flights, a lot more pastures. We, you know, we only have two flights a day with 50 pastures on there. The effort it would take for us to have tips, training, insurance, put everything in place for just a few little bottles of souvenir bottles. It's just really the effort wouldn't be worth the, the output that we would put forth on that. Cheyenne Airport, as I assume with most Wyoming airports, is not located in a place that would be a destination to support a liquor store. We're not a destination airport such as Jackson Hole. As such, we reviewed the language and determined that similar to our commercial lease space, this legislation would provide a revenue source to help sustain the airport's core mission to provide air service to Cheyenne and local residents. The funds from leasing this liquor license would directly allow us to purchase much needed equipment to maintain the $60 million runway that we're constructing right now. You know, a lot of people don't realize that we're basically landlords. We're like the mall manager. We don't really sell anything. We provide space for people to provide services there. We have rental cars, we have airlines, all those things. This is another concession that, that's the way we treat it as a concession opportunity here. Unfortunately, I was not privy to the conversations and agreements made by other airports in regard to this legislation, was not aware of the original intent of the bill. We have provided a proposed amendment that will allow a grandfathering clause. We have been working with a local developer here. We went to great expense and effort uh, to put out a request for proposal for this liquor store. We, we have several businesses on the airport. Uh, this proposed location that we uh, talked about is next to Culver's. Culver's is actually a tenant of ours as well. We have self-storage units. We have a lot of non-aeronautical uses at the airport to support our operation. We're not a rich airport. We have very limited uh, resources. If it wasn't for the COVID and the ARPA money, we would have no money at all. We'd be very broke. All we're asking here to do is the committee to consider that, you know, due to our not understanding the intent of the bill, uh, to give us the opportunity to, to grandfather, uh, uh, insert a grandfathering clause into the amendment bill that would help us move forward with this. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Questions? Okay. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. you bet. Any other public comment? We'll close public comment. A motion on the bill. Move the bill. <clears throat> Moved by Representative Walter, second by Representative Larson. <clears throat> Discussion on the bill. Want to go through, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. I have a proposed amendment. Go ahead. Um, it would be on the second page, pretty much right before the uh, uh, the, uh, the enactment uh, date. But um, uh, page two, line six, after the word aircraft. We would add such location limitations shall not apply to a commercial service airport, which as of July 1st, 2023, has entered into a commercial lease agreement for the use of the airport liquor license and location not provided herein. Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. I'm going to encourage you no know on this. This was never the intent of this bill to create a, a profit center off of retail liquor sales. This was simply a really a, a gift to the airport so that they didn't have to take a one of the liquor licenses out of their pool of licenses available to that community to allow the airport to operate. By doing this, we're simply saying, we're just gonna give airports free liquor licenses. They can use them however they would like. And, and that was never the intent. And, and uh, so, yeah, I would really encourage a, a no vote on this. For the discussion on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. no. And motion fails. Any other amendments? Ruth, question. Question as in the draw. Roll call. Representative Henderson. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Representative Stiff. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Representative Swanitzer. Aye. Chairman Nicholas. Aye. Don't give up. Find someone who will bring an amendment on the floor. Like Representative Zwanz. Okay. <clears throat> Next, I think, is the uh, constitutional amendment. Am I missing anything else? 
Okay, Brian. So the draft is six eight six. <clears throat> Let's just start with the common schools. All right, Mr. Chairman, uh, 23 LSO 685, you should have working draft 0 0.2. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not privy to how the bills have got to this point, but they're here. Um, so I will just explain um, just explain the, the, the resolution. This resolution proposes an amendment to the Wyoming Constitution um, to permit the common school account within the permanent land fund to be invested using a total return approach um, the amendment generally would modernize language in constitutional provisions related to the common school account, um, primarily changing the words interest or income to earnings, and it would clarify that investment losses to the common school funds must be made whole. Mr. Chairman, I don't know what level of detail you'd like to go through this. I can go through as quickly or slowly as you got time. As you wish. Very good. Go page by page. Okay. So page two, line 12, this is an amendment to article seven, section two. It strikes um, annual income and inserts earnings in terms of what can be appropriated um, for, for expenditure from the permanent fund. Then moving on to page three, line 10, this is an amendment to article seven, section six. The bulk of the new language is inserted in this section. So first, on line 14, again, striking interest and income. Brian? Yes. And I apologize, I was half asleep there. Did you say that that new language on, or that language on 10, the Article 7, Section 6 is new language? Most of the new, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, most of the new language that's inserted is in this section, and I'm about, oh, to, walk, okay. yeah, about to walk through that. I apologize. No worries. Um, so, so, Mr. Chairman, Page three, line 14, similar to above, striking interest in income and inserting earnings. Then on page three, line 20, um, this gets into requirements for the investment of the common school accounts. So line 17, it says the legislature shall provide by law for the investment of trust funds subject to the following. And this beginning on line 20 is where the new language is. So first, earnings which may include both realized and unrealized gains as prescribed by the legislature must be deposited or credited by the state treasurer in a separate earnings fund on not less than an annual basis. Then moving on to page four, line two, earnings in the separate earnings fund may be invested or distributed as required by law. And then on line five, the legislature um, must prescribe by law the manner, means, and timing for supplying losses or making losses to the permanent fund whole. Um, then, Mr. Chairman, the next amendments, um, page four, line 11, and then page four, line 20. This is striking references to income and replacing those with earnings. So let's go back to that Romanet 3. Why is that language in there? And what do you think it does? I, Ms. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, could you say that last part one more time? <clears throat> Why is it in there? What do you think it provides? Yep. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the simple question, you know, two answers to why it is in here. Number one, um, my direction was to replicate, I believe it was House Joint Resolution 5 or 6, <coughs> and this was in here. Um, you know, in terms of why this was placed in here, I think that was a discussion the Select Committee on Capital Financing and Investments had to include this. In terms of what this does, this just requires the legislature to say if there to pass a law that says if there is a loss to the corpus of the common school account, how that loss would be made whole. So, Mr. Chairman, and that's kind of the what we call the Meyer rule, right? And and did we not, not quite. put that? Not quite. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, a more appropriate example in this case is the level drainage district, where the level drainage district, okay. which defaulted, you know, decades ago, yep. and currently in statute, there's no identified process for making it whole. And I think that's what uh, Councillor Fuller is is okay. alluding to. Thank you. And and Mr. Chairman, this was based on, I believe, Idaho. And I don't remember if it was a permanent fund or their school fund had a similar requirement for making losses whole in their constitution. I think that was the genesis for the inclusion of this language. And how are losses defined? Uh, Mr. Chairman, they are not in the constitution. That would be, I, I think, a term the legislature would have to define. Mr. Chairman, so Don, if I could just uh, go back to the level district. There were there were bonds by that drainage district. The treasurer, the, the Wyoming Treasurer's Office, invested in those returns. There was a loss there to the corpus of of that account. I think it was in schools, wasn't it, or was it the lands? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I I believe it was the PMTF. Yes. Yeah. Wyoming, Wyoming, Wyoming. And and so that remained something that they had to carry with them for, for decades, this would say that we have to describe a method in the event there is an investment lot loss similar to that, where it could be brought back to the original, at least to cover that loss in. Mr. Chairman, yes, it, it does not, it does not foreshadow what that process is. Yes. Well, theoretically there is no loss depending on how it's invested until you, for whatever reason, <clears throat> sell some part of the corpus or sell, you have stocks <clears throat> or bonds or whatever that goes down in value and then you sell it. So unless you do that, there, there are no losses. It's not just the value of the fund. <clears throat> and so it, it's probably an easy problem to get around unless you're in a 10 year recession. Mr. I presume. Am I, am I thinking Mr. right, John? Mr. Chairman? Just, just, sorry. Mr. Chairman, I think the level drainage district is one example. There are several. I think it was the Rio Vista uh, loans in, in a community near Rock Springs, where sometimes there's just an outright default and, and there's no likelihood of, of repayment. And even in those cases, um, years go by on occasion as to, well, do we need to appropriate money? And if so, uh, when do we need to do that by? And those are issues that the treasurer has struggled with in the past. And Mr. Chairman, it seems to me that the issue arises because it's possible if by this amendment, you would be allowing uh, unrealized gains to be counted for purposes of distributions, it's theoretically possible that you could have distributions from the fund that would result in the fund balance being less than its cost basis, right? And so the goal, what I think the language should read is that the, legis the legislature shall prescribe by law the manner, means, and timing for ensuring that the market value of the fund is equal to or greater than the cost basis of the fund as determined on an annual basis or biennial basis. Because that's, that's, that's the, what you're trying to get at there, because you don't have a loss in the fund until the balance goes, the fund market value falls below the cost basis, right? Well, and that, once again, that goes into the definition of losses. It's, it's not necessarily a loss until, it's, until it is realized. So I don't think that quite works either. Well, but also, my, one of my questions is, <clears throat> having the Romanettes like this, does it fit the structure, structure and the writing style of the Constitution? I'm just curious. What it would look like. I, I tried to pull it, but my constitution is not here. But... And, and Mr. Chairman, first to go, just to add on to, I think something you had said, you know, about a ten-year loss. I think that's what Idaho law contemplates. Yeah. Is you know, if there is a sustained period of loss, you know, after I think ten years is when the legislature would have been under their state laws required to start repaying funds back to the corpus. You know, and uh, I think we had testimony on that in Cat Finn. And they basically looked at a 
they had a period of time to make it back uh, as well. So they, so it wouldn't happen all at once, but it was, it would, <clears throat> and I don't know if the constitution itself put that in or for statutory on, on, on a makeup of how you earn that back or replace it. Somehow. So, so Mr. Chairman, I think their constitution, similar to this proposed amendment, simply said the legislature had to supply losses to the One fund. Um, and, and then I believe the rest of it, how that actually played out was all provided in statute. And then Mr. Chairman, to answer your question about the structure, um, you know, more recent changes and amendments to the constitution have been drafted more in line with how we would draft a statute. I see no issue with the structure of this. In fact, on page three, line 13, um, we just add that A to provide for the candling of those paragraphs below. Go ahead. So Brian, just help me with choice of words there. Supply loss is interesting to me. And I, I just, um, is, is that a, a legal type term, investment type term? I, interesting. Yep, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, that's a term that um, has been used in other constitutions since uh, at least as early as 1895. I believe South Dakota's constitution and others use the term supply. Um, and there is there is not in Wyoming, but other states that have used that term. Um, so, so simply put, it is a, a legal term. It is one that courts have interpreted generally to mean, um, you know, making good losses or, um, you know, paying a liability and making those losses good. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. How about that? Mr. Chairman. So Brian, my question is how, how do you know when you have a loss, right? Because look, you've got a $4 billion fund invested all across all sorts of different things. Some parts of that portfolio are gonna have losses every year, right? But that's not really a concern if the other 80% of your fund is outperforming. So it all balances out and we don't consider it a loss, right? So. When do we know we have a loss? Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, um, I, I think that would be a question for the legislature to decide, should this be enacted? Um, the legislature would have to determine what is and is not a loss, and then how to make that loss whole. Yeah, the only question is then, how much do we help in that interpretation by the language they use, right? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question, oops, my question goes to the: Is there is there a need for you know like defining the period involved? I mean, we we operate on a fiscal basis, right? We don't reconcile except on a quarterly or a annual basis. So, is there a period that you've seen in this, Mr. Chairman, Representative Henderson? I, I, two ways to, to potentially resolve that question, at least in this amendment. I mean, that language, you know, is not contemplated. Um, I, it would be a, a matter of policy, you know, first for this committee, then for the body to decide the scope and detail of language that should be included in the constitution versus statute. Um, you know, should these mechanisms be more perhaps permanently enshrined and not as easily changed, or should they be placed in statute where they can be changed to respond to the needs of the times? That would, I mean, that certainly is a question of, of policy for, for your consideration. Go ahead. So that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So that leads to, to my other thought was, I mean, I've seen where it, it has their, you know, as the legislature may uh, direct or, you know, you know, the phrase I'm talking about that's in there, I see periodically, uh, for example, like in one area I know for sure is like the superintendent, the duties shall be as, you know, per the legislature, right? Can, can that be in here too? So loss will be determined and made whole as determined by the legislature? Yep. Mr. Chairman, Representative Henderson, I think that language is captured on page four, lines five through seven, the yeah. legislature yeah. shall prescribe by law. Um, the manner, means, and timings of supplying losses. Ryan, have we got over page six yet? Not yet, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Representative Larson. Uh, 
So real quickly, page, I think I've mentioned page four, lines 11 and 20. And then again, page five, line 10. Those are just striking references to interest or income and inserting earnings. Now on page six, Mr. Chairman, currently under Article 18, Section 6, if any part of the interest or income from the perpetual school fund, as the terms used in the Constitution, or the common school account is not expended, um, that portion must be added to the, the corpus. With the amendment, this would specify that if any portion of the earnings um, are not expended during any year, those earnings would be retained in the separate earnings fund. Um, or could become part of the corpus as provided by law. So it simply adds as an option, the, the earnings could be retained in a reserve account or be deposited into the corpus. It would be up for the legislature to decide how that would work. And, and we set up that um, separate earnings account or reserve account in um, constitutionally in, in 76AI. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, correct. That's and that's page three, lines twenty to twenty-three. So, Don, um, explain how you. What is what does this do for us, and why? In your language, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it does a number of of things. Speaking most recently on this, I think um, at least the interpretation of the administrators of the state is that the earnings or the income, rather, the income must be expended for the support of public schools. And that's the whole reason why we have the FMR swap, for example, that that current interpretation is that the state treasurer's office could not retain earnings um, in a reserve account. Those earnings must be expended for the support of public education. And in lieu of saving those earnings, we do a fund swap so that we're saving federal money royalties. This arguably would add that um, option of not having to do the FMR swap. And what else does it mean? And, and what else does what else does it do when, with, by turning it to earnings versus income? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I think the uh, current definition certainly does not include unrealized gains or unrealized losses. Um, and so that would be a new frontier. We only look at um, interest, dividends, and um, realized gains. So this adds a, a fourth component of potential uh, earnings and, in, and income, which um, would revise, I think, the manner in which uh, the funds are invested. Uh, more towards a total return portfolio. And I think the common school fund currently is in an income focused um, portfolio, which has more um, master limited partnerships and higher yielding stocks and, and fixed income instruments, as opposed to maybe some of the technology stocks that are high growth, but do not yield any income. Um, because I think there's a hesitancy by not by staff of the treasurer's office, not current, but ongoing, to harvest um, gains through transaction costs that are, uh, are added when you buy and sell on a regular basis. Does this change that timing of when we profile realized gains then? Would, uh, I, and I may just be seeing all of this wrong, but it looks as though as, as we change this income definition to earnings, then you might see that. But would you anticipate we would still wait to the end of the year and see what our total realized gains were or losses before we profiled? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't think it necessarily uh, changes as, for instance, those losses as prescribed by timing and means of the legislature, I could foresee a situation where you would elect to follow the Meyer rule, for example, as one mechanism for supplying losses, meaning not take any gains until such time as all losses have been resolved. I, I don't know that that's what you would pick, but it's certainly an, 
a viable option going forward. I think the big difference is the, the ability to include unrealized gains within the definition of earnings, which we do not uh, currently do. Any other, yep. anything else on this one? Mr. Chairman, what follows is just a ballot statement. So that Romanet three on page four is essentially <clears throat> in there to protect the inviolate nature of the funds themselves I think, you know, and make sure that the balance doesn't go down. Is that a fair? Mr. Chairman, I, I think that's a fair assessment and it, it puts that onus on, on the legislature to decide how to do that. Mr. Chairman, isn't it perhaps fair to say that the cost basis of the fund really is not inviolate anymore, but that you've got this provision that says the legislature needs to figure out how to get back to at least your cost basis? Yeah, that, that's, I'm just trying, I'm <clears throat> thinking of when someone reads this on the floor, what, a, what, a, what does a lay person think? And, what language would <clears throat> give them the comfort that the corpus was to remain in bio? Yeah, we might just have to say it. it would be just, just for us. <clears throat> so what this also does, if, if, if we can invest it in a more aggressive fashion, <clears throat> then it will be, number one, it will be easier to meet the spending policies and and grow the corpus at the same time. It's just a function of what we'd like to be able to do without significant, any really significant risk theoretically. And, and Mr. Chairman, just to kind of highlight two points, uh, these provisions in Article 7 do not use the word inviolate but they do use the word perpetual. The second point I would make is that the genesis of these funds is the act of admission. Uh, the, the federal law that admitted Wyoming to the union that specifies that these funds, it's only the, as currently reads, uh, depending on the, the section of the act, only the interest or the income may be expended, um, contemplating that those, those funds otherwise um, cannot be spent. Which is a different question. Yeah. Go ahead. Just, just thinking out loud a little bit, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in uh, line six, page four, the word supplying. Would it be would it be reasonable to consider a word like reconcile, reconciling instead of supplying? Or is that not used? In practice, um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Henderson, I I think the primary reason for using the word supplying was just the, the historical nature and and the fact that there is at least in other states precedent saying what that means, which generally means making losses whole. I think the question with a word like reconciling is does that only mean you have to account for losses versus making losses whole? Um, would be a, just a kind of the instant question that comes up with that a word like that. So in the original draft from last year, was it last year, we didn't have this language, right? Mr. Chairman, I, I do believe this was in last year's version. Well, that, that's, that was my question. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yep. question for Mr. Fuller. Mr. Fuller, if after the phrase supplying losses, if you said comma, if any, as may be determined by the legislature, comma. Does that help clarify, one, that the legislature gets to define what the word losses means and also signal that losses 
are not something that necessarily will occur. Mr. Chairman, Representative Stith, I think you could add that um, without giving it more thought. I'm not sure if that what effect that may have on any of the other language in that paragraph. Um, you know, the manner, means, and timing, for example. Sleep on this? Oh, yeah. So what, I mean, we have to kick this out by Tuesday, right? Mr. Chair, oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let Don chime in as, as well. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe the cutoff for the House is Thursday at noon. What that means is the bill has to be in final form and approved for numbering to LSO by noon on Thursday. I would note that this is still a, a working draft, so it has not gone through kind of the final uh, final process for getting it finalized. So there would necessarily need to be time left to do that. So on that, Brian, on that page four, that Roman at three that we've been discussing on discussing on supplying losses, it, as I read it, that applies to perpetual funds, but wouldn't apply to separate earnings funds in the event that there was a loss there that needed to be addressed? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, this would deal, that paragraph only deals with the corpus. Yep. Okay, for the questions. So, Vinny, I, I, I think we ought to just kick this out because it will be referred back to our committee. And then we'll have, we can have, we'll have um, um, Patrick Fleming come over and walk us through and, and, and it'll give us the weekend and what, whatever we need to decide if we're going to move forward with it. So, but this just puts it in the hopper. Public comment. Yeah. Public comment on the bill. Seeing none, close public comment. Move the bill. Second. Discussion. Roll call. Yep, Mr. Chairman, vote to sponsor 23 LSO 685 for sponsorship by House Appropriations Committee. Representative Henderson. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Representative Stiff. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Representative Zwanser. Aye. Chairman Nicholas. Aye. Seven aye, Mr. Chairman. Okay, next one. Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, 23 LSO 686 0.2 permanent mineral fund, permanent mineral trust fund distributions and investments. Mr. Chairman, this is a bit shorter, uh, mostly owing to the not needing as many conforming amendments. So similar to the common school resolution just considered, this resolution would amend um, the constitution to allow the, the permanent Wyoming mineral trust fund to be invested using a total return approach. Um, and modernize language to account for today's investment realities, uh, primarily in terms of referencing earnings. And then similar, um, it would require that losses to the permanent fund be made whole. So page two, moving to line 19 through 20, just clarifies that the permanent fund remains inviolate. And then just as this language on lines 21 through 23, very similar to the the previous resolution, the legislature shall prescribe by law the manner, means, and timing for supplying losses to the permanent fund, so to the corpus. Page three, line one is another reference, just making clear that the permanent fund shall be invested as prescribed by law. And then line three, um, strike or line two strikes a reference to income and says that all investment earnings, which may include both realized and unrealized gains as prescribed by the legislature, shall be credited to a separate earnings fund on not less than an annual basis. Then the next sentence on line six says that the separate earnings fund may be invested, held, or distributed as prescribed by the legislature. The change on page three, line 10, is just a reference to make clear that it's the corpus, the permanent fund that may be loaned, to political subdivisions. 
Um, and then page three, line 11, just repeats the loss language in terms of supplying losses from loans that are made to political subdivisions. And then what follows, Mr. Chairman, is the ballot statement. Any public comment on the bill? Seeing them, we'll close public comment. Moved by Representative Larson. Second. By Representative Stiff. Discussion on the bill. This one's actually really easy. Okay, roll call. Okay. Mr. Chairman, 23 LSO 686 for House Appropriations Sponsorship. Representative Henderson. Aye. Representative Larson. Aye. Representative Sherwood. Representative Stiff. Aye. Representative Walters. Aye. Representative Zwanser. Aye. Chairman Nicholas. Aye. Seven eyes, Mr. Chairman. So, you know, what we'll have these come back to us. And what I'd like to do is have Patrick, as well as the uh, treasurer, come over. And <clears throat> in order to get two thirds, we're going to need the treasurer's blessing on this. And I believe that he's said he will. You know, so we, it, <clears throat> that's a cat in a wet bag. So, we have to make sure that it happens. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Chairman, <coughs> you want to do the other re referrals that you, you got today? Sure. Thanks, Brian. So um, we've got two of them 30, 38, and 59. Is that right, Jackie? <coughs> these are one, these are um, from transportation. Yeah, the, these are. Uh, the chairman's, I, I told him we'd do them without him because they're very simple. Okay, re referral for House Bill 38. So, Mr. Chairman, remind me, I thought at one time, have we not gone back and forth on an this, I know we're just talking money, but it, it appears here that we're adding back in spouse or dependents of acting members for uh, educational assistance. And I thought, did we, did we not have that in there, then we remove spouse and dependents? And then sure, the, that sure is my right. And now we're putting them back in, is that? This is... If, if I might provide a little background, I was on transportation in this interim when we're looking at this, and primarily what this is focused on is just a way that the guard recommended, you know, to encourage current guard members to refer others to the guard for purposes of, you know, reaching their uh, end strength or, you know, uh, amount. Uh, the, the Army Guard is is doing well. It's it's in the high 90s. The Air Guard is the one where they're having trouble. And uh, so it's a it's a five hundred dollar referral. There are some sideboards to be related to a period of time that has to go by. I think it's uh, six months or something before you know it's paid out. That's pretty much what it's about. We had a subcommittee that looked at it for we met I think four times, three or four times, and uh, the last committee uh, committee meeting the transportation meeting. We should have voted to sponsor it. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, also on page four, it authorizes a half time FTE uh, to carry out the duties of figuring out who gets these uh, one time bonus payments for a successful referral. So there's 144,000 appropriated for that half time employee. And then there is 808,000 appropriated to actually pay for the bonuses. So my inclination to, to uh, what's, what's, what's the other one? Here? Thirty-eight. I'm looking at fifty-nine. Okay, I was looking at fifty-eight. So, so I, I'm inclined not to take any action on having to present this to us because I don't know. 
So, so, 50, so I was just reverse 30 is, is a referral, but 59 is providing education. Um, if I'm reading right, maybe I'm not reading right. 30 is a million bucks. Go ahead. Did I understand correctly? You weren't sure if they were both free referrals? They are both free referrals from this morning, so. So we're getting some. Yeah. yeah. I would. So I, I think we'll. Yeah. We won't do this today. I don't like them as much as I thought I might. Or they're not as easy as I thought they would be. Concern about the amount that was being appropriated for the period of time, the number one. And then number two in the subcommittee, I voiced a concern about you know, we have almost a third of our guards from outside of Wyoming. And we had a bill last time that we passed into law and you know to the uh, relative to their education in state tuition for outside guard uh, non-resident guard members. My recommendation would be to hold off and maybe if we do something that's go a little smaller amount for a shorter period, get some results. Okay, well, we'll um, I don't think that's all we got to do today. I think so. 